today, and I'm, I'm going to have to shame my niece for not showing up because she actually gave me the title for this message. And I was reading her Facebook one day, and she said, I've determined that there's a large amount of lame in this world. And lame for you old people is a hip way of saying uncool stuff. Sometimes what we have to do is get you into the vernacular of the young. And she said, and to sum it up, she basically said, but I've learned that love trumps lame. And I thought, that's a good name for a message title. I'm stealing that, and we're going to talk about love trumping lame today. So daily, we are bombarded with opportunities, some for growth, others for pain and recession, but they seem to kind of come relentlessly. And we're always getting opportunities thrown in front of us. And I know some of us don't look at it that way. We think, no, I've got pain thrown in front of me. No, pain is an opportunity. Okay? Sickness is an opportunity. Disease is an opportunity. Death is an opportunity. For what? Listen. (laughs) Because in these times, what we have is we have a choice that we can make. And it's one that better encompasses the real nature of free will. And I'm not going to get into all this right now, but... You know, we have this notion in our teachings on free will that we can outwill God. That's what free will has boiled down to in modern day Christianity. You have free will, therefore, you can outwill the creator of all life. Do we realize what we're saying when we make statements like that? I don't think we ever stop and think about the kind of things that we say. I don't think that we've thought about why the world has so rejected what we've offered is because it's garbage (laughs) and they needed to reject it. Why do they reject a father who willfully abuses his children to prove his love? Because they need to, because that's not a father. I'm not the best dad in the world, but even I can spot that as crap. Or lame, if we want to keep it clean. (laughs) But in times of suffering, loss, pain, grief, lame, (laughs) we can choose how we're going to respond. And this is where our free will does come into play. And I'm not talking about, you know, avoidable suffering. We have these movements, and thank God none of us are a part of it, but we have these movements that go on in the body of Christ where people willingly throw themselves into painful situations to prove that they are holy because they are suffering for Jesus. Okay, that's avoidable suffering and you are a moron if you put yourself in the way of avoidable suffering to try and grow yourself. Knock it off. I'm not saying this to any of you. I'm saying in case there's anybody online watching that happens to be doing that. Get away from the suffering if you can avoid it. If your husband is beating you, leave him. On the flip side, if your wife is beating you, don't ever tell anyone but leave her. (laughs) Don't. Put yourself in the way of avoidable suffering. It does not make you more holy. We can call it faux martyrdom. Because this is what we like to do. And we have people that love to play the martyr. Get over it. Stop being a martyr. Be one if you're being one because it's unavoidable. If you're being attacked and you're being hated and you're being despised and you're being killed because of your profession of faith in Christ, be a martyr. I think that's something that the modern, especially grace circle church has really lost sight of. Oh, well, God wants us all rich. God wants us all successful. God wants us all. Look, this life sometimes is filled with crap. And sometimes it's going to get all over you. And sometimes it's going to take your life. And that's a promise of Christianity. Isn't that a great promise? (laughs) 
So we have total control. And dad says it this way, you know, I, he says that God told him, I've given you absolute authority over the outcome of the events of your life. And I want to say it this way, we have total control not over what happens to us, but in how we deal with what happens to us. Because we can make a choice at that moment what we're going to do. We have a choice in how we deal with suffering, how we deal with pain, how we deal with grief. You know, it's not that hard for someone to choose how they're going to deal with it if they win the lottery. God! Why did I win the lottery? Why have you chosen me for such pain? Not that hard to rejoice when the sun is shining and your business is doing well and you've got money in the bank and you've got a job and your family is provided for. And we can, in, in, our, in our American Western mindset, you know, and I do this all the time, we can get into modes of, of bitching and complaining because we look in our refrigerator and we're out of red apples. Got 48 green ones in there for juice, but we don't have any red ones. <laughs> it's not hard to make a choice to rejoice when everything is hunky-dory. But when stuff starts to come, it's awful hard to make a choice. You know, we sang this song about, after all, you were faithful. And I know, you know, I can almost feel the religion rise up in people when a song says the word sovereign. God is sovereign. We've just misunderstood sovereignty. Okay? Okay. Sovereign means that good will come from every circumstance. It doesn't mean that he has brought every circumstance. And he is always there wanting to help us work good out of the situation. See, we act like what happens is, you know, I I get stabbed in the side and all of a sudden God's gone. Or we act like God was the one who brought that so that I could grow. No, God was right there with us being stabbed. And now he's here to help us move forward and to grow and to make something good of that and to turn that into good for us. Yeah, he'll turn that into good for you. And sometimes we can't see past what's hanging in our face to see how on earth can good possibly come from what's going on right now. So how do we learn to deal with these events that we've summed up as lame? What do we have at our disposal that enables us to come through these events in a way that leaves us not worse for the wear, but better? (laughs) John 16.33 says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So isn't it nice, if this was the charismatic 2013 grace-believing Bible, it would say, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have absolute freedom from tribulation, but be of good cheer, Because what we've taught people is, nothing's ever going to happen to you. You can be stupid. You can drive down the road drunk without your seatbelt on and pray for protection. And if you really have enough faith, you know, you you might make it home fine. Does that mean God was protecting you or you got lucky? (laughs) I want to say you got lucky. You might get in a head-on collision and kill not only yourself, but a few other people, does that mean that God withdrew his protection? No. You are being dumb. (laughs) And sometimes the fruit of dumb is a problem. (laughs) Sometimes you slide by under the radar. (laughs) No, he says, in the world you might have tribulation. I mean, in the world you will have tribulation. 
And this is treated as a bit of a shameful promise of the gospel. It's like this is the verse we don't talk about. We've all got a few of those, you know, that don't fit into our belief system. So this is, we, just, we don't talk about that. That's not one of the ones. That's not one of the ones we're going to address. Sometimes there's a way to explain these shameful verses out, and that's fine. But this is one that I don't hear preached a lot. In this world, you will have tribulation, and everybody's like, amen. No, nobody amens that in America. They say, in this world, you will have tribulation, and chances are you're not going to have the billion-dollar building that you want because you're not teaching people that it's all going to be angel feathers and gold dust for them from now on. Jesus has just finished telling his disciples that he'll soon be leaving them, that they'll be scattered. And then he says, I've told you all this, that you'll have peace. What? (laughs) You're leaving us and we're going to be scattered and you've told us that so that we'll have peace? Thanks, dude. (laughs) So then it's for our peace that we're promised tribulation. So let's break this down a little bit. Let's look at, look at some of the, the definitions of the words. And look, you know, you don't got to be a Greek scholar to read the Bible. But sometimes it's really nice to see what's actually being said. Okay, and there, there are things, look, you can, you can go all, all Greek on for God so love the world. And guess what it means? For God so love the world. All of them. It doesn't mean part of them. And that's okay. But sometimes when you go in, you find something pretty amazing takes place. In this world, cosmos, literally that which passes away as opposed to that which does not pass away. You will have tribulation, outward pressure, as opposed to inward distress. But be of good cheer to be firm or resolute in adverse circumstances. I have overcome or vanquished the world this same thing that passes away. Jesus is promising us pressure from that which fades away. He is not promising us possession from something inside. Pain, grief, suffering, all that is lame is what fades away. He tells us we can be firm because he has vanquished that which fades away. Now, do we need to, uh, do we even need to talk about this? Yes, but do you see that Jesus doesn't say in this world you will have tribulation from people? No. We need to understand that everything that comes against us is not of people. And this is a tough one, and even for me, because a lot of times, you know, when you feel like someone is, look, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just the way that I word things sometimes. Maybe it's that I'm 35 and I appear confident, so people think I'm arrogant. You know, I'm not arrogant. I'm insecure. That's why I appear confident. But it seems like I could write, for God so loved the world that he made the sky blue. And 48 people would disagree with me about which tint of blue the sky was. Are you saying that everybody is going to be in this blue sky because God loves them? Does God not yield to our free will in creating the sky blue? Don't we have to choose to make the sky blue? I mean, it's like... So I finally just had to say, look, I don't care anymore. You can disagree with what you want to disagree with. I'm going to say what I think. But the problem is not people. The problem is what we can call the powers. And I'm not going to get into all of this right now. But the powers apply pressure from the outside. Okay? Via means of circumstance rather than from the inside via means of possession. But we can be of good cheer in the face of those powers, not people. 
with the peace that he has given us because he has, in fact, vanquished those powers. A defeated foe that is trying to fight again is really fighting a futile battle. And a lot of times what we do is we succumb to the pressure that's being applied, not realizing that what's trying to apply pressure to us has been defeated. In every way, defeated. Not partially still alive and successful. The powers will always try to rob our peace, our comfort, and our rest. We need to be certain that if anything is robbing us of peace, comfort, or rest, it is something that is trying to become your God. Because this is the very thing that the Father promised through the Son by the Spirit. He's the Spirit of comfort. Jesus says, my peace do I give to you. He left us with rest. And when things are trying to steal that from us, that thing is trying to become our God. And at the point that we allow it, it has just become our God. When I got that revelation, I won't say I completely stopped because Kevin and my dad will call me out on that, but I got real better (laughs) at not throwing my golf clubs into trees. And I quit shouting swear words at my ball when it went off to the right. (laughs) But you know what happened too? I started enjoying the game a lot more. Because once it ceased to be my God, it started to be my game. And it was no longer controlling me. I won't go as far as to say I now control golf. Because anybody who's ever played will say, liar. Kevin has this game figured out. And then second, and we should know this full well, but we need to understand that Jesus' promise to us does not mean that he will cause anything to happen to us to test our mettle, to prove us, or to grow us. What we do with our pain, how we handle it, will often do these things. It will test our mettle. It will grow us. But to say that the loving Abba of Jesus does this removes his very nature as loving and removes him as father. And it makes him the CEO of an industrial corporation as opposed to the loving, caring Abba of all. And this is the God we've presented the world with in most cases. You have a CEO who sits on his throne in heaven and is testing you because you are a product for his benefit. And based on your decisions, you will either be in paradise or smelted. That's what they do with gold. They smelt it. 1 John 4.4 says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. A lot of times this verse is used to talk about our authority over the sinner. I've actually heard this talk quite a few times in that light. You know, you can go into any terroristic country because greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. If we would just take a step back and realize what we're saying a lot of times. A simple contextual reading will reveal that the world, in this case, and specifically he who is in this world, is, again, the powers. Okay, and you might be offended that I'm calling the forces of darkness powers, but you know what? I am all for depersonalizing them as much as possible. I don't even believe that they need an identity. And we get so hung up Oh, well, the devil's doing this and Satan's doing this and the demons are doing... You know what? Stop personalizing them. Call them the defeated powers and move on. Our 
Our problem is not our spouse, our sickness, our grief, or our pain. Our problem is pressure that is being applied from the outside. And when we understand this, we can start referencing Jesus' words, be of good cheer. I have overcome the outward pressure of that which fades away. And when we get caught up in the issues of life and we start playing this blame game, which is something that we all do, yes, even me, I know. That's hard to believe that I would play the blame game. (laughs) But I do it. We all do it. We all love our scapegoats. We love to have someone to blame for what we're doing. And when that scapegoat is successfully sacrificed or removed, we begin to rejoice. You see what we've done? This person was actually our problem. See, they're gone and now we are better. And then what happens is when we lose focus, what we try to do is apply Bible verses, mostly out of context, to our situations as though they were a magic band-aid. I got as many amens as I thought I would get on that. When I wrote it, I amended it. I said, amen. And then immediately I thought, nobody else is going to say amen to that. (laughs) But this is what we do. We get in conflict with another human being, another child of God that he loves and cherishes, and we say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, and you start to claim authority over this person that you're fighting with. Try that when you're fighting with your wife, guys. You want to see the fight get even more brutal? (laughs) I have authority over you. Oh, yeah? (laughs) Guys, there is nothing we can withhold from our wives that will ever cause any damage. They have about 300 things they can withhold from us that ruin us instantly. (laughs) Usually what we do is we quote these Band-Aid verses a set number of times as though vain repetition accomplishes much. But if we can keep things in proper perspective, remembering what it is that is our problem, outward pressure from the powers, and we can take hope from Scripture, and specifically the words of Jesus, John, Paul, and others, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Then it's no longer a Band-Aid verse. Then it's something that can go right to the heart of the issue and bring about healing. When we realize what's going on, Depression is not an inward issue. It is an outward issue. It is something applying pressure. It is depressure being applied. And when we can realize, Don got it, when we can realize (laughs) that something else is applying pressure and stop playing the blame game for all the things in our life, I don't care what you're blaming, it's not your fault any more than it is your spouse's fault. I'm not saying we don't need to take responsibility when we've been a jerk. Okay, guys? We do need to take responsibility, okay? But we need to understand that the sickness, whatever it is, is being applied by an outside force. And I'm not not trying to get into this whole demonology thing, oh, everything's a demon. No, no. Sickness isn't from God. The powers then are destined to fade because they are in this world and we can enact their fading more quickly by resting in the peace that Jesus has given. More specifically because you have overcome them. You are of God, little children, and you have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. And if you already have overcome, my goodness, that makes it easy. We've done the same thing with this verse, the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. 
And I remember I asked my mom a long time ago, I mean, before we really begin taking the path that we're on now of, of looking at people as included. And before we really, I, I, I said, you know, what does that mean? Why, did, why does it say the wealth of the wicked is stored? Doesn't God view everyone as righteous? So then who is that supposed to apply to? And most of the time what we do, and, and especially if we're building a new building or we're launching a worldwide TV broadcast or we're doing you know, something that requires a lot of money, we begin to say that anyone we want money from must be unrighteous and that their wealth is stored up for us because we are righteous. How many of you have heard this verse used in taking up offerings? Oh, the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. You know what that does in your heart? Let's just say that someone who's been your friend for a long time does something to you and they happen to be a wealthy person and you take them to court. And you, in your mind, oh, well, wait. The wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. What they've just done to me is wicked. Therefore, I have legal right to all that they possess. And we laugh about it, but it actually happens. And so what we say is that anyone we want money from must be unrighteous. And what we begin to do is we create us and them. We are righteous and they are not. We are poor and they are rich, therefore their wealth must be ours. And we see this play out on a global scale. And we see it play out in the church. And it's disgusting. Because God loves each and every one of his children the same. And he doesn't view any of us as wicked. He views us all as righteous. I often wonder how we would take verses if we were to just throw the opposites out there. The poverty of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. I don't think you'd ever hear anybody preaching that message. Well, no, look, if God's going to be, you know, some cosmic divine Robin Hood and take from one and give to another, it needs to apply across the board. So if he's taking from the wicked and giving to the righteous, does he only take their wealth? What if they're sick? Is he going to give me that too? What if they're poor? What if they're in a miserable relationship with their spouse and I've got a good one? Crap. Is he going to give me that? No. So who's righteous? According to Paul in Romans, justification of life has come to all men. If indeed justification of life, righteousness, has come, past tense, to all men collectively, I'm reading you some of the Greek words, then it is not people who we ought to be referring to as unrighteous. This verse needs to leave the mouth of the church once and for all in relationship to people. Because what's going to happen is, and it happens over and over and over and over, and it's going to happen if you proclaim this verse and you're referring to people, this will happen to you. You're going to get into full-blown mimesis, which is desire leading to disaster, and begin to assume that anyone who is wealthy is unrighteous, therefore I deserve their money. I'm not going to make any political comments. But what we're talking about is how love trumps lame in our lives. Well, we need to understand that there is no way we should ever take from the gospel that there will be no lame times in our life. In fact, it's a promise of the gospel that there will be lame times in your life. But when these lame opportunities present themselves, we have something inside of us that can and always does trump lame. It's the ace of spades. Love. And I love how people have made a religion out of love. 
I'm not religious. I'm not a Christian. I don't believe in all. I just believe in love. Look, that's all pretty to say, and you're very flowery when you say things like that. But it's utter crap. Because love is not an impersonal force. Love carries no meaning apart from the person who gives it to the person who receives it. It of itself did not save you. Love did not deliver you. God was in Christ reconciling the world. And that is love. And he was unleashing that love on people. Love means nothing without people. We can't define a force like love as an impersonal force apart from the very beings that give it meaning. And this is what we started to do. We're, we're branching out, and I know none of you guys are, but we're branching out into religious pluralism of, oh, everything's okay. I'm okay. You're okay. You can believe however you want. You know, you can believe however you want. You're free to do that. But the very heart of inclusion is that Jesus Christ loved us. And this is love, not that you loved him, but that he loved you. So love is only a force when it is implicitly personal. Love as a word is nothing but love exercised as a father loving his children becomes a force that accomplishes great things. It was the Father working through the Son by the Spirit that did these things, giving us the very definition of love, which is self-giving. Love by nature is self-giving, and this is what is on the inside of us. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is faith. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the insert recent movement here translation. (laughs) Religion likes to tell us that God will love you on your way to hell. And this is going to be really uncomfortable for some of you. But if John tells us that God is love, and Paul tells us that nothing can separate us from the love of God, please do the math in your head. God's love never leaves us, never forsakes us, never lets us go. His love is with us whether we believe it or not, whether we accept it or not, and whether we want it or not. It invades our will to love us. It says, I don't care what your choice is. I love you anyways. I don't care that you don't believe in me. I still love you. You know, and I've told this story about my kids and riding up and down the street and God says, hey, if a car came barreling around the corner, would you run out and knock your kid out of the way? Even if it meant that you would be hit, absolutely. Absolutely. Do you think you're a better father than I am? And he said, what about the other kids that aren't your kids? Yeah, I'd push them out of the way too. You think you're better than me? Would you invade their will at great personal harm to yourself and take the cross to render them saved? Absolutely. We're just going to read the whole thing of 1 Corinthians 13. And what I'd like you to do is to keep in mind that John said, God is love. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. 
Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, and is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. For I know in part, but I shall know also as I am known. And now abide these three, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. This verse has been taught many places that I've attended as how to prove that you're really walking in love. No, this is not a verse of requirement. This is not a passage telling you what you must do to prove that you are in love. This is a passage telling you what the Father is inside of you. It's a description of the ever-abiding presence of the Godhead within. It is how they deal with humanity. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to go through these, and we're just going to look at the definitions of these words. I was reading this the other day, and I kept having to stop and just think about all of the garbage that we teach that doesn't stack up against what Paul has said, love, and therefore the Godhead is. Suffers long to bear up under provocation without complaint. The love that is the Father handles any action of ours that ought to make him annoyed or angry without complaint. Sounds a little bit like slow to wrath, but worded a little better. Guess what kind means? Kind. Merciful does not parade itself. It means to heap praise on oneself. Contrary to popular belief, God is not seeking your praise. I know that shocks some of us, especially as worship people. Oh, I just want to sit around and worship God. That's fine if that's what you want to do. If it's really what you want to do. But it isn't what your father is seeking from you. When I get home from work and Gabby has gone to pick the kids up from school, it would make me sick if they were sitting in the living room with guitars singing to me. I would say, no, come give me a hug and a kiss. Your friends aren't around. Tell me hello. Tell me you missed me. Tell me it's good to see me. We were not created for worship, but for sharing and fellowship. How many of you had kids so that they could praise you? How did that work? No, really. (laughs) I'd like to know how to make that happen. Can we see what we do to God? I mean, I think I thank God (laughs) that I wasn't raised under the abusive church that a lot of people were raised under. We didn't go to church a whole lot. When we did go, I didn't pay attention. And whenever there was garbage being taught from the pulpit, my dad would sit there and go, no, 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 no. And mom would just go, "Ah, we can't come back here. And then we disappear for a few weeks and we find a new church. Regardless of how cute I thought the girl in the youth group was. Because I have this astounding view that God actually is the Father that Jesus revealed him to be. You see, the incarnation says something extremely powerful to us that God refuses, refuses to be God unless he can also be Father. Before he created man, he was father. 
before he became God in the sense that a being that is worshipped, he was father. We need to get that. His primary identity is father. And when we begin to view him as a father, all of a sudden, all of the schisms of Western Christianity don't make sense anymore. Well, I'm splitting because of this, and I'm splitting, and we have 40,000 denominations in Western Christianity, one in Eastern Christianity. I'm not even going to say what that does to us. <laughs> and every time one of these schisms happened, it's because they had a different view of God rather than Abba, which is the always loving father of Jesus and who he revealed. Well, yes, but the Old Testament says, and yet Jesus said, it is written, but I say, several times, revealing the errancy of the Old Testament text in many places in relationship to who God really is. If you want to get your doctrine reset, do nothing but read the verses where Jesus says, the Father, and you'll start to get a grander picture of who the Father really is. He doesn't want to be seated on his throne, enthroned on your praises. He wants to be rolling around on the floor, giving you raspberries. Or play in poker, if you're a man. He wants to do what you want to do. He wants to be with you and just enjoy your presence. I said this in my worship class, but you know what? Our worship would change drastically if we would realize that the situation is really reversed. And please hear me correctly, God is always with us. But the real heart of worship is that he is banging, trying to get into our presence. He is constantly approaching us, constantly coming to be with us. Saying, hey, I want to hang out with you. I'm not abiding your presence, I want to be with you. Love is not puffed up. This means to cause to have an exaggerated self-conception. God's love is not self-seeking or self-promoting. He is not exalting himself through his love for you. He is exalting you. Does not behave rudely, and we've heard this, oh, well, that means you can't swear. Well, then the pastors in this church are in trouble. No, the love that is the Father does not behave disgracefully, dishonorably, or indecently. Okay? And this is something that, you know, we we love the marriage metaphor. I am the bride of Christ. And look, the marriage metaphor is a good metaphor for the relationship that the Father has with humanity because, and that's fine, and I get that it's a committed relationship. It's something that God hates divorce, so he's never going to divorce from you, and I get that. You are not the bride of Christ. You are his brothers and sisters. And we are not in an incestual relationship with our brother. God is my father, not my father-in-law. Love does not behave indecently. Incest is indecent. I'm going to get some emails. The next two, I think, are really the heart of it all. Does not seek its own. These words mean to devote serious effort to realize one's desire or objective, to strive for, aim at, try to obtain, desire to wish for. More literally is translated, does not seek herself, and means does not seek to be returned in like manner. Let's look at what that means. Does not seek to be returned in like manner. The Father isn't seeking for anyone to love him back. He's not sitting in heaven, biting his nails, waiting for you to say yes. 
He loves you regardless. Jesus is not sitting with his cell phone waiting for his prom date to show up, hoping there's going to be enough food at the feast for the few who respond. No, he's already had a place prepared for you. I go to prepare a place, not I go to hope that you will come. This is the very center of love. It is self-giving, not self-receiving. And we could get into all kinds. Look, I could teach a message on how you are not loving your spouse if you're trying to get anything from them. And you would all feel convicted and you would go home and apologize and we would have a great marriage revival. But the love that is inside you is the Father's love and it is self-giving. And yeah, let it flow out. Instead of trying to get from your spouse, give. Give and give and give, expecting nothing in return. And many times you won't be disappointed. (laughs) Is not easily provoked means to cause a state of inward arousal, to urge on, to stimulate, especially to provoke, to wrath or irritate. Get this loud and clear, that God's love cannot be provoked to wrath. Period. It is not God's love might be provoked to wrath if you do this, this, or this. No. And the word easily is not even in the text. The text is God's love is not provoked. Wrath is not even a part of the equation. Thinks no evil. To give thought to, to think about, consider, or ponder anything socially or morally reprehensible. Literally, love doesn't focus on the negative. Again, God's love in you is not focusing on the negative in you. Whatever that might be. Whether it's your sin or your lack of tithing or church attendance or your lack of faith. Look, and I see people be told all the time, oh, well, you're sick. That's a real, that's a fruit of of a lack of faith. You know, if you're sick, you, you, you just need more faith. But that's not God's love because it doesn't do that. Does not rejoice in iniquity. Solitary state of happiness and injustice, wickedness. What could be more unjust than someone bearing our sin and us still being punished for it? You see, one thing the Western church has done, we've backed ourselves into a corner. Because we've started with a God who is just. And this is the way that all the, the, you know, minus a few particular denominations, we begin with God as just, and God's justice must be served. And so this is how we justify our doctrines that we have about penal substitution and things like this. Oh, well, you know, in in order for sin, we must extract this much flesh to pay for the sin, and there must be death because the wages of sin is death. And we have this just God. But the problem is we've backed ourselves into a corner. Because love does not rejoice in iniquity. Love is not happy in injustice. And if love is not happy in injustice, like I just said, what is more unjust than the man who we say was stricken by God, taking our sin and us still being punished for it? So if we're going to start with justice, carry it all the way out. But if we do what Jesus did and start with love, love doesn't punish. Love disciplines, but it doesn't punish. Discipline is always restorative. Punishment is always destructive. 
You think about our penal system in America. It's a system of punishment. It is meant to end relationship. Discipline is always meant to restore relationship. And please don't hear this as God's going to spank you. What's more disciplinary than to be in the midst of your darkness and be told, I love you? I love what Joseph Prince says. He said, if you're addicted to pornography, stop trying to go away from pornography. Watch it and say, I am the righteousness of God, and he loves me. Because that will discipline your heart. Because you'll receive love, and it corrects. And it's restorative. But rejoices in the truth to experience joy in conjunction with someone over virtues like righteousness and holiness. Again, this is speaking of the Father's unwillingness to do without involvement from others. He is unwilling to simply be God. His desire is to be Father. And then we have these miraculous statements that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Bears all things of love that throws a cloak of silence over what is displeasing in a person. Does not allow it to move you one inch. Believes all things to consider something to be true and therefore worthy of one's trust. Believes all things within you. Hopes all things to look forward to something with implication of confidence about something coming to pass. Do we get that? The Father's inside us with confidence looking forward to what is coming. Endures all things to maintain belief or course of action in the face of opposition. Or we could say in the face of unbelief, he maintains his belief or course of action. Or we could say it like Paul says, that if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. And the words all things here, you know, all is a confusing word in the Greek language. It takes up about eight pages of the lexicon I use. And there are times it means some, there are times it means many, there are times it means all. And what we've got to do is we've got to rely on context because context determines meaning, not meaning. And some of you might go, what? What does that mean? Well, What we like to do and what the, the etymology that we're taught to use is to look at the root words, combine those together, and this is therefore what that means. That's not so much true. And let's do it this way. I love you, Gabby. How many of you know that that means I love my wife? I love being kicked in the face. How many of you know that that means I hate being kicked in the face? I love this pizza. Does that mean the same thing as I love Gabby? No. I refer to one of my guitars as my love. So in that instance, love means guitar. Context determines meaning. So when we see all of Judea came out to hear him. Does that mean literally that everybody that was in the entire country came? No. It means people from all parts. When we see, because of one man's disobedience, all were assigned disobedience, what does that mean? Did anybody escape what Adam did? Okay. Then that means that what is coming next follows suit. The all in the next verse doesn't change. Just as through the one man's act of obedience, justification of life has come, past tense, to all men collectively. Okay, so this is how you determine what all means in a situation. You read the context. Is Paul, Jesus, James, John, Jude, are these guys talking about some of all types? No. Most of the time, they're talking about all. 
In this particular context, it means totality with focus on its individual components. Love believes all things. It endures all things. That means there is nothing that you can do that he will not endure in you. Nothing. There is no choice you can make. There is no decision you can fake (laughs) that will make him not endure what is going on in you. Sin does not separate you from God. If he couldn't abide sin, he would have stayed in the garden and kicked Adam and Eve out. He approached man continually before the cross, trying to say, I'm here, I'm your father, please listen to me. And then what does Jesus do? He comes on the scene and says, he's here, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's not coming in 2014, it is at hand. I don't believe that any of the prophecies Jesus gave about the so-called end times have anything to do with the age that we're living in now. Might the world be destroyed one day? Probably. We're greedy and we're violent. Does that mean the prophecies Jesus gave have anything to do with it? Not necessarily. Maybe. You can tell me I'm wrong if we get there. <laughs> Love never fails. I want you to hear this because this definition actually made me laugh. A negative indefinite point of time. That means forever, it will be never failing. (laughs) For throughout eternity, his love will be never ending. As long as there is eternity, you will have his love. It's a negative indefinite point of time. It never becomes inadequate. This is what fails means becomes inadequate for any function, never weakens. It's not a light that grows dimmer. Notice it doesn't say it never gets stronger. It never stops pursuing you. It never stops chasing you down and saying, I love you. Ever. Ever. For eternity, it will never fail. Prophecies will fail. Knowledge will fail. Tongues will cease. But greater than faith, greater than hope, is love. Greater than all that is lame is love. So when we say that nothing can separate us from the love of God, do we realize what it is that we're proclaiming? I hope so, and I hope we can start proclaiming it a little more passionately. And that we can tell people who are on the street begging, here's $100, his love will never fail you. The center of divine love is self-giving as opposed to self-receiving. And we've been taught that God's love is only beneficial if we receive it. And we will only have it if we desire it. But the truth is found in the meaning of these words penned by Paul. Love does not seek its own. Love does not seek herself. She does not seek to be returned in like manner. The love of the Father is not seeking reciprocity. I used it in the sermon. It was given without condition, self-giving. We've conditioned others to believe that God's love is self-receiving, that he is waiting for you to return it. But here it is in black and white, God is not seeking for his love to be returned. Do we return his love? Yeah, we do but that's not what he's seeking. Do I love the Father? Absolutely. Do I love Jesus? Yeah. Do I love the Spirit? Yep. Do I love you? Eh. 
most of you. <laughs> the verdict is still out on some, no. <laughs> Look, we do love God, but this is love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us. This is love that he loved us. Okay, has nothing to do with our reciprocating that love back to him. We can only do what he has already done for us. We can only be what he has already created us to be. We see it in the Old Testament. We see God tell Abraham, I'm going to steal my dad's teaching here. You shall be the father of many nations, for I have made you the father of many nations. You're going to be what I've already made you. So why can love trump these lame situations in every instance? Because love is seeking nothing from us, only to give to us at every turn. And it's always seeking to give us what we need in that situation. And I've said this here before, love is not love when it's exercised in spite of darkness. It's love when it's exercised in the midst of it. It steps into our garbage and it says, I love you regardless. And I'm going to be here loving you, and I don't care if you ever change. That's tough for us to get because we've taught this message, God loves you just as you are, but too much to keep you that way. No, he loves you just as you are now. End the sentence. Love will change you. But you know what? It might not be what your pastor thinks it ought to be. And it might not look like what Christianity has told you it needs to look like. We don't have a monopoly on God's love in the Christian church. We think we do. Say something even more bold. We don't have a monopoly on God. Christian means Christ one. If we really believed what we proclaim our title is, we'd probably be out walking around giving everything we have to everyone we meet, healing everyone we come across, and revealing the loving Father to everybody. Amen? Amen?